Welcome back to another video. So today I want to start off, yes I've got my headphones on, I wanted to start off by uh, addressing some of the updates that I've heard. So I've seen a lot of things online, um, I've seen some really disturbing videos of uh, dead children being loaded up into uh, body bags. I saw it on Twitter actually. Um, I'm probably going to have nightmares about that for the rest of my life, especially since it, you know, it's not really clear, but, you know, any of those kids could easily be my son, but, yeah, there's a lot of people dying in, uh, over in, uh, Wuhan. In fact, uh, just last night I saw a significant jump in the official numbers of dead and the official numbers of, uh, infected people confirmed. Sounds like it's, uh, somewhere around 60,000 now. That's what my wife is telling me. She follows it a little closer than I do. Um, I heard some reports from an expert uh, outside of China, and they believe that, you know, up to 90% of the population of the planet could be infected, is what I... I'm not very clear on these numbers, but it sounds like uh, they think that a lot of people will be infected with the virus, not just in China, so we may just have a head start here. Um, and it doesn't sound good if the uh, 2% mortality rate from the virus continues to hold well you can you can guess where uh, where those numbers will go I, I don't really want to go into that or focus too much on it but I, I'm hoping that governments outside of China are watching what's happening here and they're seeing the struggle that they're they're putting into things here where they're throwing everything they've got at the uh, the situation and still they're, you know, they're struggling to contain the outbreak. So I really hope that people are paying attention and preparing for this because once it breaks, con you know, containment, which it sounds like, you know, it's already in other countries. It's just a matter of time. And I don't want to sound like, you know, it's the end of the world or anything, but maybe, uh, maybe do a little bit of preparation because... I, I don't think that they're going to institute the same kinds of controls that they have here, which may in the end be beneficial um, in some way. Obviously, there's going to be severe economic damage, but, well, things could be a lot worse. If everybody just got infected, you know, this is the most populous country on the planet, so it would be very bad, obviously. Now, having gotten that out of the way, I, uh, I want to talk about more pleasant things. Obviously, uh, the virus situation is a very unpleasant thing. So somebody in the comments asked um, what uh, what dialect they speak here. And if you know anything about China, they, uh, well, every little place has its own dialect. So you, you learn Mandarin and that's going to be useful if you're in mainland China because pretty much everywhere you go, people will speak Mandarin. But as far as... Uh, when you actually hear them speaking when you're in a different place, it's almost a completely different... In fact, in most cases, it is a completely different language everywhere you go. Even little villages might have their own dialect. So out here, they do have their own dialect, and it's not specific to... I'm, what I should say is it's more specific than just, you know, Anhui province dialect. It's... Uh, I don't even know what you'd call it. Um... It sounds kind of like Mandarin, but a little bit different. I can give you an example. In Mandarin, if I wanted to say, you know, to eat, I'd say chi fan. But out here, instead they say ke fan, which throws me off sometimes. I've gotten used to it, so I, I know what they're saying when they say it, but it's just a little bit different. And, you know, another example, if you were in Guangdong province, obviously, that, well, maybe not obviously, unless you've been there, they don't speak Mandarin as their uh, their official dialect there. Uh, they speak Guangdonghua, which, or Cantonese, is probably something a little more familiar. Uh, I'll use that term. So, let's say I'm saying hello, you know, in Mandarin, I'd be saying Ni Hao, which most people have probably heard at least at some point. But in uh, Guangdong, or if you're in Hong Kong, they'd be saying something more like Ni Hua, which sounds sort of like it but anyway it's a it's different um they're, those two they are completely different you can't when you hear them you'll know what i mean they even have uh 
different tones. So out here, they have their own dialect, of course, and it, it's close to Mandarin, though. So you can kind of get by if you know Mandarin. And most people, especially younger people, they'll they'll know Mandarin. I mean, they, they learn it in school. They have to use it. That's the common language for the whole country. So, but yeah, don't don't be surprised when you're in Shanghai or somewhere like that and they're speaking a language and you've learned some Mandarin and you're thinking like, well, what language is this? This doesn't sound like what I learned. Oh yeah, it's uh, every place has its own language. That's something you'll learn if you ever come to visit China. Now I asked my son today if he wanted to join me in my videos and well, now that's Chinese. It means I don't want, or basically that he, he doesn't want to. So he'd rather watch TV. In fact, uh, he, he was actually watching Ponyo. It's uh, for anybody that doesn't know, Studio Ghibli, he loves those movies. And it's something I can stand to watch. It's a lot better than the weird Chinese cartoons that he watches all the time. Well, I don't know. I try to follow. There's some kind of cartoon with, like, these two bears and an old man. I just know he starts yelling, Shong Shong, Shong Shong, which means bear, bear. So he loves that one. I, I don't follow it too well because my Chinese isn't very good, but he sure loves it. So that's what he's doing right now. He's just watching TV watching his, uh, his movies or whatever. That helps to keep him calm. Otherwise, he'd be running around the house destroying everything. But uh, I'm glad we still have internet and electricity out here. Otherwise, I don't know what we would do. Uh, hopefully it doesn't come to that, but I'm sure we'd find some way to entertain ourselves. But uh, I do want to talk a little bit, I guess, about life out here in the Chinese countryside and what they do. I'm sure a lot of you have noticed uh, me walking around in these fields and rice paddies. So I thought I'd show you something and maybe explain a little bit about what they do out here. Okay, so I wanted to uh, point out this mess that you see here in this mud where it's all uh, trampled a bit. And kind of what happens is they uh, set a water buffalo loose in that field and they'll do it in a bunch of these and just let it wander around uh, I'm not sure exactly what the point is uh, maybe it just fertilizes the field I don't know but they uh, eventually follow it up they fill these things with water they get in there and they put rice down rice little little bits of rice I don't know the exact process but yeah they grow rice out here that's most of what they grow and eventually, when the rice is ready, they pull it out, of course, with a big machine. And then, for whatever reason, they throw it all over the road. I'll have to, uh, after this is all over and the time comes, I'll have to come back and show you guys what I'm talking about. It's really annoying to me because if you, I have to drive over it if I ever come out here. And it gets stuck all over in my car. So, <laughs> it's kind of a pain to have to clean it off. But that's what they do. I guess they're they're looking for uh, people to help, I guess, in a way. to I don't know what's, what's going on there. Sometimes you'll see these old stones. I don't see any around here, but they used to go out and they'd use these big stones to roll over the rice. And I guess to get it out of the whatever pot it's in, I guess. I don't know. I'm not a, a rice farmer, obviously, so I don't know exactly how it works. But I have watched them doing it all the time. I've never actually gone out into the fields to help. It looks like it'd be quite a mess to do so. You have to get out in the mud and yeah, it's it's a mess. Believe it or not, grandma and grandpa still do it. Um, I've talked to them and talked to them about, you know, they need to take it easy, but I think they feel like uh, they just, they need to do something. So, or they've just been doing it for so long that they uh, they still go out and do it every day. So, I don't know, maybe that's what they do to keep going. They're pretty old and they're still moving around, so I guess it's worked. I, I can only hope to be able to move around as well as they do when I get to be that age. Obviously, Grandpa has some health problems, but, well, he doesn't let it slow him down. He continues to go out and do things. Lately, they've been uh, chopping up bits of wood and burning it into this uh this contraption that they've got and i guess they spread the ash 
The contraption is called a fireplace. Out in their uh, their garden and then till it into the ground or something. I, I guess it adds nutrients to the soil. I'm not sure exactly what it does. I'm not a farmer, obviously, but uh, I do see them doing that. I see everybody doing that out here. They do have some land. If you remember in some one of my other videos, I talked about uh, there's some younger people that came out and they pay people to be able to farm their land. And they do have a lot of, a bigger piece of land that they could farm, but they, uh, they use that, you know, they get money from those guys that go out and farm out here, which is good because <laughs> I don't know, they definitely shouldn't be farming on a large scale. They need to take it easy at this point. But uh, yeah, that, that's, that's something they do. They go out and they garden all the time. They, uh, they've lived through a lot. They've seen a lot of changes here in China. Obviously they lived through the, the whole thing with the cultural revolution and the, uh, the great leap forward and all those wonderful bits of history. It's my understanding that, um, grandma, she doesn't even remember, you know, her parents because they died when they had the great famine and when she was really young and they, uh, they have a lot of stories about how difficult it was, you know, and food. Food is a big thing in Chinese culture, and I think it has a lot to do with that because a lot of people grew up in times when they didn't have food. So it's one of the things they do when they greet you. They don't just say, you know, like me, I'll say ni hao or whatever. But if it's someone you know, they'll usually ask if you've eaten. So they'll, you know, oh, ni hao, you know, ch ch fan lama. It's a, it's a big deal. Everything seems to center around food. Ah, I wanted to take advantage of the fact that I'm not around anybody and to take off my mask and enjoy some fresh air. Feels great. So, another thing I wanted to talk about. In the comments, I, I mentioned uh, Hui culture when uh, talking with someone. And I got that wrong, so... Hui is only part of the word. It's Hui Zhou culture. And maybe some of you have seen uh, the movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. A lot of those buildings that they have in that uh, are actually Hui Zhou architecture, which is Hui Zhou architecture. It's from Anhui province. In fact, some of the movie was actually filmed in part of Anhui province in uh, Huangshan or Yellow Mountain. There's actually a city called that as well that's right there at the base of the mountain. And there are some villages out there with really, really old Huizhou architecture that you can go look. It's, it's a really, really neat to go see. If you ever get a chance, um, when this whole thing is over, you should definitely go and visit. It's, it's really amazing stuff, especially go to Huangshan. If you go there, you'll have a chance to, uh, to be able to see what I'm talking about and to go see the mountain, which uh, is beautiful itself. When you see it, you'll see where a lot of the inspiration for old Chinese paintings comes from. Uh, the mountain literally looks like it belongs in a painting. Wow! So the next time you see one of those old Chinese paintings, you can say, Wow! That's actually what it really looks like! I can't believe it! It's amazing. So, if you ever get the chance, and it's really easy to get there too. Um, you can come into any part of China and there's a bullet train that'll take you right to Huangshan City, and there's tours that'll take you up there. If you want, and you want to spend the money, they actually have hotels on the mountain itself, so you don't have to be like me, where I went on a national holiday, and there was, like, all of China was there on the mountain. You can go, and, you know, there's all kinds of crazy trails that you can take. If you look it up, you'll see there are trails that most people probably wouldn't dare to go on, but... There are others that are just fine, like what I went on. Of course, it took me seven hours to, to hike the mountain, and I didn't do nearly what other people have done, but you can actually stay up there in a hotel. It's, uh, I'm not sure on the cost, but it, it's a really beautiful place, well worth visiting. Like I said, you'll see it and you'll say, wow, those paintings are actually of something real. I figured it was just some imagined landscape, but no, there's some really amazing places here in China, and that's one of them. There's another one here in uh, Anhui province. They're both in Anhui province. But uh, there's another one called Zhou Hua Shan, which is, well, my Chinese is terrible, I know. Anybody that knows Chinese is going to laugh, but 
it's basically nine peaks mountain. Johashan. And every peak has a temple on top of it. And it's, uh, it's another really amazing place to go. Now, all of these places, like I said, you can connect to them simply by bullet trains. So, well, I'm not sure if there's any real easy way to get to the Nine Peaks Mountain, but definitely Huangshan, because it's a World Heritage Site, is pretty easy to get to. And as I mentioned, a lot of these places are here in Anhui Province, so this is a place that most people don't think to visit, but it really is a, a good place to visit. Um, if you just want to connect to them with the bullet train, a good place to stay would probably be Hefei. That's the capital city of the province. So anything you could possibly want, you can get it there. Of course, McDonald's and KFC and Pizza Hut. They even have a Papa John's there. So if you don't want to eat Chinese food or you just want to try something from back home, they have it. Uh, shopping, of course, there's giant shopping malls everywhere. But uh, yeah, good, good location. They've got several uh, high-speed rail stations. So if you wanted to stay there and have access to all of those sorts of things, you can just hop on the bullet train. It'll take you right to uh, the Yellow Mountain or wherever it is you want to go, or really any place in China. So that's what I would do anyway. Of course, I lived in Hefei for a while, so I know what I mean. <laughs> Maybe I'm biased because I live there. But it's an interesting place. The city itself has a lot of attractions to see. Uh, it's maybe not quite like Beijing or somewhere like that, but uh, they do have their own little attractions. So it might be a, a place that's good just to stay if you wanted to go see the Yellow Mountain. So they're saying it'll probably be April before everything really starts to wind down with the virus. Um, the officials are saying it's probably going to peak this uh, this month, somewhere later this month, which is what we expected, and then hopefully it'll start winding down, and hopefully everything can go back to normal. I uh, I've heard some bad news as far as businesses. I heard the Burger King actually pulled out of China completely. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but uh, if it is, then that's really unfortunate because I like Burger King so. That means when everything does go back to normal, I won't be able to go get my Whopper or frame broiled variety of burger anymore. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna be stuck with Big Macs. Not that I go and eat that all the time, but well, that's unfortunate. Either way, I'll just hope that Papa John sticks around. Of course, there's no Papa John's around here, but uh, it's always nice to be able to eat something like that. Uh, we'll see if uh, Taco Bell managed to survive the whole thing in Shanghai. They just barely started up opening up there again, so we'll see. I don't know what the economy is going to look like when it's over, but it's not looking good. Hopefully there'll be some way of recovering. But so far it doesn't sound like there's really a plan. I think they're too focused right now, which they should be. They should be focused on just dealing with the virus. Yeah, the economy isn't worth uh, a lot of people dying because of the virus, so. But we'll just hope for the best. We'll see what my plans are going to be, if uh, I'm still going to be focused mainly here in China, or if I'm going to end up uh, changing the direction of where I do business to somewhere else, like Europe or something, and we'll see. I don't know what's going to happen with the virus. Like I said, they uh talking about you know, two thirds of the population of the planet might get infected with the virus before it's over. And so we'll see, we'll see how it affects everybody else. Like I said, China may just have a head start on this and everybody should be paying attention to what's happening and doing what you can to prepare. Make sure you've got face masks and some canned food and a can opener. So just in case, and plenty of water, you've got to have a source of good drinking water. All good things to have because, well, you don't know what's going to happen. And if the government, you know, you can't count on the government to be prepared to take care of you. You've got to be able to take care of yourself. I don't think you probably need a bunker or anything like that. But, hey, yeah, bunkers are pretty cool either way. 
if I could have a bunker, I'd have a bunker. Not because of the end of the world sort of situation, just because, hey, if I can say, I've got a bunker, it just sounds kind of cool. But either way, I think I've got about all the updates that uh, I can think of for today, so I'll go ahead and end this here. And maybe tomorrow we can talk a little bit more about village life in China. And I guess we'll see you in the next one.